good. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord? If you're not excited, it's because you haven't been encountering God lately. Amen. We need to have an encounter with God. I'm excited about what's happening in the church and the ministry and the plans that the Lord has for us uh, to finish out the year and going into next year. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things are going to take place. There's going to be some surprises, I'm sure, that uh, many of you are not expecting. Uh, you'll find those surprises out in the next couple weeks. But um, good stuff. Amen? So 2 Kings chapter 6, say amen when you get there. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And we want to hear your word today. We want to hear it with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask you right now in Jesus' name to bring forth illumination upon your word. Begin to speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us to receive your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take a seat. Praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. Let's say it again. Everybody say, praise the Lord. All right. The title of the message is called The Power of Obedience. The Power of Obedience. And I'm going to use an example that doesn't really have too much to do with obedience, but you'll be able to see clearly the benefits of obedience to God. So 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Let's go right there. And if you're not reading, obviously we have the scriptures for you. Amen. And the word of God says this. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So he was consistently watchful. So to, to stop real quick, Syria wants to make war with Israel. And the man of God, Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha is giving the king a word. He's telling him what he should and should not do. So, verse 11, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, he thought somehow that he had someone on the inside of his kingdom, inside of his council, that was going and sharing his secrets with the king of Israel. So it's like, imagine America was going to bomb a nation tonight, and somehow that nation were to find out, but not because of military intel, but because of a prophet. This is exactly what was happening. And so, as we continue to go down, it says, verse 12, and one of his servants said, none, my Lord. So there's no one who's betraying you. There's no spy here, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That's powerful. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God, so Elisha is this man of God who gives the king of Israel a word, but Elijah also, Elisha has a servant under him. Amen. And he says here, when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army 
surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Here it is, this man of God, Elisha, knows his authority in God, knows his mission, knows his calling, but the king of Syria now knows about this prophet, and he says to his military, I want you to bring this prophet to me, probably because he wanted to kill him, because now he's not just a prophet, he's considered a, a, a special intelligence operative, okay? See, they're, they're, we're, we're talking about some serious, being a prophet is not just telling somebody, thus saith the Lord. I personally believe a little bit that the, uh, when it comes to being a prophet, a little bit differently than what we've been accustomed to think in churches. I believe that a prophet is not just someone who speaks and says, this is what God's telling me to tell you, but a prophet is somebody who speaks on a national level. They, they not only have information about someone personally, but they have information about nations, kings, world events. So anybody can come up to you and say, thus saith the Lord. That can be a prophecy, or that can be a word of knowledge, but that doesn't make one a prophet. A prophet, as we look in the Bible over and over and over, dealt with governmental issues, dealt with principalities and powers and high issues, not the lower level entry stuff. So here it is, this prophet is hardcore. He's so well renowned at this point that the king of Syria hears about him, and so he sends his army, and his servant sees this army when he wakes up, and he's scared. Can you imagine being a servant under a man of God, and this man of God is considered public enemy number one? You'd be scared. Hold up. <laughs> Prophet, you're sleeping. Wake up. I want you to look outside the window. There's a whole army that's ready to kill you, and I happen to be with you, so I think I might end up dead too. And Elisha, the man of God that he is, just calmly says to him, relax. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You know, I'd have a problem if I was that servant and I heard him say that, I would say, uh, you're a prophet, not a military commander. What do you mean those who are with us? What do you know, what do you see that I'm not seeing? And uh, let's go back here and see what the word of God says. Verse 17, one of the, my favorite verses in all of the Bible Go there real quick. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Go to the next verse. And when they came down to him, Elisha, speaking of the military, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. You want to talk about power. You want to talk about authority. This was a bad, bad, bad man. I mean, can you imagine having a next door neighbor? That, you know, if you just, if you say the wrong thing, you know, he just, he puts a curse on you. This was a man of God, unlike any that we've really ever known. Two men of God that I consider just tops when it comes to prophets were Elijah and Elisha. Moses was wonderful. Moses had a little bit of a different type of uh, responsibility. But Moses was not able to raise the dead. Elisha was. We're talking about a man of God who sold out completely 
to follow God 100%. And you see right here the benefits that absolutely came from having a relationship with God. So I, I want to help you see today that obedience is not boring. Obedience absolutely pays off. You might not feel like it's paying off immediately, but it will. You might feel, well, pastor, I've been putting God first and I've been obedient and I'm not where I want to be in my career. If you continue to put him first, I promise you, he will bless you. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else will be added unto you. That's a promise. You need to cash in on that promise. See, it's not enough just to read the word. You got to recite the word back to God. You got to say, sometimes you got to get a little frustrated and you got to get real with God and say, hey, Lord, I've been obedient. You told me to put ties to, to, to the offering plate. I did it. You told me to wake up every morning at a certain time. You told me to spend time with you and lift my hands. I've been doing it. I, I want to see, just give me something. Lord, I don't mean to upset you, but let me see a sample of the glory that's on the way. Give me something that will keep me going to know that it's going to be all right. Give me something to remind me when I'm weak in my faith that putting you first is worth it all. Lord, you ain't got to buy me a Lamborghini. But take care of my car note this month. Lord, take care of my food. Lord, my children want to go on a field trip and I don't have the money to pay for it. Can you bless them? I'm telling you he'll do it. You quote his word back to him. He said again, seek ye first. I want you to say that with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else will be added unto you. That's a promise. I get sad because I see my generation and we're doing the opposite. We're seeking the things of the world first. I say this with, with complete love and complete humility before the Lord, and I give God all the glory, but no one would be in this church right now. You would not be seated in your seat if I did not make the decision years ago to suffer and put God first, I had to go through a process. There was a time where I was living from house to house, friends house to friends house, just trying to take care of the church while my family was living in Virginia, and I was alone. My car was beat up. I couldn't even pay my car insurance sometimes. I'll never forget one, one particular time this evangelist named Joshua Roman. It was his first time coming to our church, and he didn't know nothing about me, and he had prophesied to everybody, and he was dead on that particular day. And he came up to me, and he said in front of the whole church, he said, I was younger at the time, and he said, you've been having to ask your friends for gas money. And it was absolutely true, and I, sh I was shocked and I broke down, and he gave me a word, and he said, and God's about to change your fi financial situation shortly, and the Lord did. There were many times where, me personally, where I got upset or I got frustrated, and I said, hey, I've been serving you. It's time. But I'm going to tell you something about God, and I hope you listen to this, and I hope this encourages you, but he never gives you what you want when you want it. I can't name one thing I've ever wanted and got it when I want. God, I wanted a better car. I had the beat most worst car ever for five, six years. But, you know, I didn't care. I was happy. There are people who didn't have a car. Busted taillight, engine leaking oil, bad catalytic converter. The, uh, the AC barely worked. The heat, you had to turn it all the way up to the top knob. Seatbelt wouldn't buckle because a penny got stuck inside of it. I mean, I went through a hard time. And let me tell you something. You might think that was by accident, but I promise you it was not. I promise you it was going through a test of fiery trial where God wanted to prove my motives. 
Do you really want to be obedient to me? Do you really want to answer the call to ministry? Do you really want to pay the price? Are you really willing to go all the way? Obedience will pay off. I promise you, you might have to break up with that girlfriend or that boyfriend, but I promise you, you won't be crying about it when God sends you your husband, when God sends you your wife, and when you're not at the divorce court. You'll be happy when you said to God, your will, not mine. Yeah. Obedience is not fun. <laughs> I think everybody in this room could at least cite one or two times where the Lord asked you to do something that you did not want to do. Especially if it came to relationships. Because there are some people that you know the Lord put on your heart, you ain't have no peace about them. You ain't need to fast and pray. The moment the peace is gone, the Lord is gone. Some friendships, certain jobs, the Lord said, I don't want that for you. But we're so good at negotiating away the voice of God because what will happen is when God has given us an instruction, we'll sit on it long enough till the voice evaporates. And then we will pretend and try to negotiate within ourselves that because God is not saying it again, somehow he's changed his mind. I want to tell you something, and I, and I want you to hear this. The book of Ecclesiastes says there is a time and a season to everything under the sun. Y'all know that, right? Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? There's a time and there's a season. I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. A time is when God's saying, you need to jump and you need to jump right now. A season is a gap, a window of opportunity where God gives you a little bit more time to do something or accomplish something, but a time is when the Lord says, do it now because it's, it's, this is passing. I'll never forget when we were at the old building, the, the, the ministry was growing and we were kind of getting too big for that particular building, and I remember I felt in my heart, move the church now. And I didn't do it because this is what I said. I said, you know, I'll wait till we overflow. And when we overflow, then I'll move the church. And what happened, I, I learned a very big lesson. What happened was a couple months later, the church just started decreasing. The numbers out of nowhere. There's no particular reason, just boom, numbers start going. I said, what in the world was this? And then I felt the Lord speak to me. He said, when I give you a word, you have to take that word immediately because I'm moving. And I learned this. When you see God moving, you have to move with him. Because if you don't move with him, he's going to keep moving, and you're going to have to wait again for that window or that time to be given to you. It might be the same thing with marriage. God might be telling you it's time to get married, and you, you, you're so fearful. You're so scared. Let me, let me make this very clear to everybody. And, and I want to help somebody here. Um, some of you might know, I asked God a very honest question maybe four or five years ago. And I mean, I was, I was so sincere. I was crying when I asked him because it was such a big thing on my heart. And I said, Lord, I, I, I need to understand. I said, what do you do when you're in love or with your wife or your husband and then you fall out of love? I said, what do you do? You're not going to want to work on the marriage because you're not in love. I said, what do you do? And I asked him, not because I'm married, because I'm not, never have been, but I, I'm so concerned about being a good husband, and I want to be prepared because you're going to go through moments where you don't like each other. And you want to know sometimes the answers to such a big question because the way she feel about you today might not be how she feel about you tomorrow morning. Vice versa. I was so sincere. Never got an answer. Always really concerned me, you know, like how am I going to get married one day without this answer? 
What do you do when two people, both, don't love each other anymore? But he gave me my answer two weeks ago, out of nowhere. And he said, Kareem, love is a decision. It's not a feeling. And I waited for a moment for the Lord to give me some scripture to back that up. And he reminded me of how Jesus loved us and he saw us when he was in Gethsemane. He saw us when he went to the cross. He, he didn't feel like being obedient. Jesus didn't feel like loving us at that moment. He didn't feel like laying his body down. But because of love, not a love he felt, but a love of commitment, he laid himself down as an act of love for us. Thought about that, and I realized that love is not a feeling. It is a decision. That will help you. You don't always feel like, uh, I'm sure some of you parents don't always feel like changing your baby's diaper. You don't always feel like taking care of your husband or your wife or your mother or your father when they're sick. But you do it because it's love. Somewhere along the way, we've lost sight of what real love is. And we've gotten caught up in the feelings and in the emotions. And that will mess with us because your feelings won't feel the same all the time. It's a decision. The obedience is a decision. And obedience is love. But it's something else. Last night the Lord helped me to see this. He said, obedience is war. I said, what? I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, obedience is absolute war against the enemy. It is telling the enemy, I'm fighting you. <laughs> I'm obeying God. I want nothing to do with you. God is worthy of my praise. He's worthy of my obedience. He's worthy of my allegiance. And I am not going to bow my knee to you. Amen. Obedience is absolute declaration of war. It is saying, I align myself with the king. Have you made war lately? I want to make some war. I want to make the enemy a little bit upset. He might attack you. Sure, he attacks everybody. Don't think you're so special. Some Christians, you wear, like, you wear your attacks at night like a badge of honor. I'm going to tell you, he don't attack me at night because I don't let him. He don't come up in my house. And if you do, I'm going to tell him, get on out. Same way you came in, you can go back right, right out. Obedience is war. Obedience is love. Obedience is a decision. I don't think that everybody here loves to pay their tithes. Anybody love to pay their tithes? Anybody love to give offering? No. You know why? Because you're giving a part of yourself. You're dying to self. You're dying to greed. You're dying to hoarding. We don't like that, especially when you want to go buy something on Black Friday. Church offerings probably go down in the month of November. November and December, uh-uh, you're getting pennies and nickels, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Obedience is not always fun. But I'm going to tell you something. Obedience is more than just, God, I love you and all. Obedience is absolutely not just for us. It's actually to bless others. Because when we are obedient, we are in a position in which God can use us to bless those around us. We need to stay in obedience to keep our ears freshly open to hear the instruction of God. 
Watch this. The man of God called upon the name of the Lord. Like, like this is, I, you know, I love God, right? How many of you love God? I love him. But I, I don't think, I mean, I might be wrong. I've never tried this. I don't think I could just go up to somebody and say, Lord, blind them. I don't, I don't maybe, maybe I ought to try sometime. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I'm curious to see what level I'm at, but I, I, I don't think, let, let me be honest, let me be so really honest with myself and with you, even if I, if, I don't even, I just don't think I'm there. If it can be done, I don't, I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> That's a pretty cruel thing to do, but it had a purpose. Now, now, Elisha is not the only, he's not the only one in the word of God who did that. Paul did it. This is why Jesus said, bless and curse not. Jesus had to tell us, bless and curse not, because you have the power of both. You do. You absolutely have the power of both. Now, there were some people opposing Paul, or, or, or a guy. He was opposing the message Paul was preaching, and Paul cursed him. He cursed them in the name of the Lord, and a darkness fell upon him in his eyes he couldn't see for a season. You, you want to talk about authority. I mean, Paul was the man. Paul was like the modern-day Elijah. Elijah was known to go up in a mountain at times and spend time with God, you know, and, and all that, the Mount, Mount Carmel, you know, and Paul went to Mount Sinai or in, in Arabia, you know. Paul was a man of authority. But I don't think you get there without obedience. I mean, can you think for one second how quick this was? There's an army outside of your house, and I mean, he didn't take an hour to pray. He just said, Lord, blind them. That's it. We don't even read, he said, Amen. He just said, Lord, blind them. You know why? You know why he didn't have to say Amen? Because he. It's, it's a continual conversation with God. We're talking about a man who prayed. We're talking about a man who learned from his spiritual father. His spiritual father was Elijah. As a matter of fact, he called when Elijah ascended into heaven. He said, my father, my father. He didn't, he didn't just look at Elijah as this man of God. He looked at him. You're my spiritual father. You taught me everything I know about God and everything I know about the prophetic. You taught me everything. So he receives this double portion. He receives this mantle. And if you go and you'll do your, your, your study, uh, uh, the prophet Elijah did 12 miracles. 12. Elisha received a double portion of the anointing. He did exactly 24. Talk about power. When God tells you he's blessing you with something, he means it. He's going to fulfill that word. But to be able to just call on God that quickly and see God show it. Now, maybe you don't need to curse somebody. <laughs> but maybe you need God to come through for you in a financial way. Maybe you need God to come through in your marriage. Maybe you need God to come through in your business. Maybe you're having a hard time at work. They've given you some new assignments that you just can't seem to understand, and you, you think that it's above God, that God doesn't care. Let me tell you, if you ask him, he'll help you. You would be surprised at what God is willing to do for his people. The problem is that we only leave him to do certain things. We only want to, or save my soul, thank you very much, I'll, I'll figure out the rest. He's meant to do more than just that. He wants, to, he wants to be incorporated in your daily life. He wants to be incorporated in your family. He wants to be a part of your business. If you include God in your business, it's a guarantee, I'm telling you, that thing's going to take off. But relationship is where it starts. From relationship, obedience. Obedience gives us a couple things. Gives us boldness, gives us authority, it gives us faith, it gives us favor, and obedience always blesses other people. And I'm going to get to those in a second, but we're going to finish this off real quick. So it says this. Verse 19, and Elijah said to them, those who he blinded, this is not the way, nor is this the city, 
follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. See, they don't even know that the prophet of God that they are looking for is talking to them right now because they're blind. So Elijah's tricking them. He said, follow me. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you where you need to go. Now watch this. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. I mean, again, we're talking about a man of God that the moment that he calls on God, God's already listening. I call this an open heaven. There, there are some people, the heavens are closed over them. That means that for them it's a little bit harder when they're calling on the name of the Lord to get a response because there's not a relationship, there's not a connection there. But there are people on the face of this earth, and you can be one of them, that when you call on his name, he shows up immediately. Think about that. Think about when somebody gets healed because you prayed for them. Think about when you are prophesying to somebody. Think about when, when a demon is being cast out of something. Think about when, when you've asked God to touch someone to feel the presence of God. There are so many people that I prayed for over the years. And I, the, 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 the number one thing I'm passionate about more than anything else, more than healing, is the presence of God. I can't even name how many people I have prayed for who have never felt God's presence to feel his presence, and they felt it. Now, I want you to think about that one second. They come up, or they're in their seat. They never felt God. The moment I pray and I say, Holy Spirit, touch them. Bam! They get touched. That's an open heaven. He's listening. Now, don't mystify this thing somehow and think that he's only listening when you pray. He's listening to this message. He's listening to your thoughts. I'm going to tell you something that happened to me years ago that was so amazing. I was doing a teaching on the tabernacle of Moses. And a teaching on the temple. It was one of the best teachings I've ever done. It, it was weeks in, weeks in length. It was deep. And it was the last service. And I was going to talk about uh, the inside, the Holy of Holies where the presence of God resounded. Now, something interesting happened to me that morning. My message wasn't ready yet, but I was asleep, and all of a sudden I had this dream. And let me just use this as an example to really help you to try to understand what God showed me. See, this is a, this is a curtain, okay? And if you could imagine... Just pretend these lights is the glory of God. In the temple in the old days, when there was a temple, there was a, a veil. The veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Behind the veil was the glory of God and the Ark of the Covenant. Now listen to what I'm going to say. In the dream that I had, I saw... A, a curtain. I saw a veil, and this is what I saw. I, I, I saw it moving, but it was like puffed up. And every time the veil would puff up, I would feel the presence of God in my sleep. And every time that the veil would go down, I would feel the presence of God released. And then it would puff up again, and I would feel the presence of God and go back down. And, and I'm looking at this, and then I woke up and I said, what is that? I said, I know God's talking to me, but I don't know what he's saying. So this is what I do. I decide to Google it. I put, and I didn't even know how to word it. I put, curtain blows up, presence of God. Curtain blows down, presence of God fades. Because <laughs> I, I didn't know. What else? And to my surprise, this Link comes up, and it says the Ruach HaKodesh. I click on it, I read it, and it says, the Jews believed that when the presence of God was in the temple, the curtains would blow up, and the curtains would blow down. They called it 
the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the Holy Spirit, but it was translated God breathing. You know, I was shocked. I have never had a dream in which he was telling me what to preach on. And let me tell you something. What he was doing, I was going to talk about the friends of God, but I was not going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I didn't see that connection yet. After that, I saw that connection and I, and I preached and incorporated how that was the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and here's the amazing thing that really hit me. I said, you've been listening to my preachings. You've been listening to what I've been talking about. And you wanted, he wanted to give me a pointer. He, he wanted to help me to say, hey, hey, I love what you're doing. It's great. Don't forget, talk about the Holy Spirit. You talked about the Father in the temple. You talked about the Son, but you haven't talked about the Holy Spirit. That's what we call relationship, where God's communicating with us. Now, there are some of us, you, you get disappointed because you say, God, I want you to talk to me. He's not talking. Well, just remember something. He knows that you want him to talk. If he's not talking, it's because it's not the time. If it's not the time, you continue to seek his face. You continue to pray. You continue to press in. I promise you it's going to work out. Don't get discouraged. Don't get upset. You don't know. You might be one more hour away from hearing his voice. You might be one week away from hearing his voice. And how many people are so close to hearing the voice of God, but they turn around at the last moment? So this man of God brings these soldiers to their enemy territory. What happens next? Look at this. Verse 21, and when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, my father. Oh my gosh, the king of Israel calls him my father? Look at that. The king says, my, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? He says, set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Verse 23, look how big this is. And he prepared great provision for them. In the NKJV it says this, then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their masters, so the bands of Syria, Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. You see, he killed them with kindness. He gave his enemies a feast. And after he gave his enemies a feast, they didn't want to invade Israel. See, obedience is such a huge thing. Imagine if the prophet of God didn't have that connection. Imagine if he was just decided to, I'm, I'm going to be disobedient this month. I'm going to do what I want to do. And all of a sudden, God didn't hear him, and then they invaded Israel, and the war starts because of nothing. You see how one man's decision can affect a whole nation? One man. Right now, there's a man in, who's going to be our president, and that one man has the Ability to make decisions that can affect our nation. One person makes a difference. Look at this. Go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Boldness. I want to touch on these five keys that I've made so far for the benefits of obedience. And the first benefit is boldness. The Bible says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, when you are in a place of obedience to God, there's a boldness when you pray. You don't have to say, Father, please. I know I sinned last week, but <laughs> you ain't got to do all that. Stay in obedience. You say, Father, in Jesus' name, and you, just, you can storm the, 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 the throne room of heaven. God, I need you to do this. Say, how can you talk to God like that? Sometimes you got to do it. You know, it's funny. Me and Papa talk about this sometimes. I've noticed that when I've yelled at the Lord, he moves. Is there any, am I just the only weird one who's done this? Is there anyone else you've ever gotten upset or you've ever, you know, lifted your voice to the Lord? Not in a disrespectful way, but all of a sudden, it's like, all, oh, 
So that's what it takes. Thank you, Lord. But, but God wants you to get real with him. He wants you to be real. So, boldness. Number two, authority. Look at this man's life. When you have time and you're at home, go through the scriptures and read about Elijah. And then read about Elisha. And see their devotion to God. Their devotion brought the authority. You can't ask God to do something on your behalf uh, if you're not in obedience. It's not going to work the way you want it to work. You could take one Christian that's in obedience and one Christian that's in disobedience, and one person gets healed, the other doesn't. Now, it's not necessarily because of the people, but here's the one thing that you need to understand. When you're in disobedience, your faith is low. It's not that the power is different. The power that heals is the Holy Spirit, right or wrong? Does the Holy Spirit become weaker somehow because of your disobedience? No, your faith to appropriate and release the power of God is not there. So now you're not praying with confidence. Now you're saying, Father, if it be your will, peak, I open. Whereas if you're in obedience, you're just like, be healed. How many of you have ever been in that place of obedience that you, you just know, if I ask God, I mean, it's done. I don't have to beg him. I don't, have to t I don't have to speak in tongues for 15 minutes and get this thing going. It's just, God, done. The next thing is faith. Now, this is big. I want you to, to jot this down, Hebrews chapter 3 at verse 12 and 13, because I want you to see what sin is meant to do. Look at this. Take heed, brethren. The audience is brethren. He's talking to the brother, uh, to, to the believer. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Everybody say unbelief. In departing from the living God. Next verse. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Watch this. Sin deceives and hardens our heart and causes us to depart from God. Let's go back to verse 12. I'm going to break it down again so you can see it with me. These two verses are huge. Absolutely huge. So when we talk about, Pastor, can a person lose their salvation? No, they can't lose it. They can forfeit it. Satan can't take it away. But you can give it away. You can give it up. How? Is it by sin? Listen, this might shock you. It's not by sin alone. It's not the sin that's the issue. It is the issue, but it's not. The bigger issue is this. How does a person get saved? Is it because they were holy? No. You get saved by grace through faith. It was your faith, right? It's faith in Christ that saves a person. So if it's faith in Christ, then the opposite is what damns a person. The problem with sin is this. Sin destroys your faith. Prime example is, watch this. Maybe some of you can witness to this. Is there anybody here that when you were in disobedience, you began to question whether you were saved? Look how many hands go up. That, but why? You were a sinner when you came to Christ. You, you've been a sinner after you've been with the Lord. He never changed his position toward you. But the enemy worked on you right here. He said, you see, you're not saved. You see, there's no way that you're going to go to heaven. And so he starts to try to destroy your faith. Sin gives an opportunity for the enemy to take away our confidence in God. It's not that God ever changed. He loved you when you were a sinner before you came to him, and you were probably a worse sinner than you are right now. Am I right? So it's not, it's not like God knew he was getting a perfect thing. He knew when he, when he got you, you're jacked up. <laughs> Okay, it's going to take a while to get you right. Amen. And even after we get you right, there's still going to be something else messed up. Marry that woman, and I promise you something's going to get jacked up. You know, he, he, he knows. He never changes his love toward us. But we lose our faith in him. That's why the Bible says, if we are faithless, he is still faithful. 
So let me read it again. Take heed. Listen up, brethren, lest there be in any of you in a what? An evil heart. So you got to combine these two verses. What is the evil heart? Okay. An, an evil heart of unbelief. So an evil heart is an unbelieving heart. Right? In departing from the living God. Next verse. But exhort one another daily why it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives, and it causes your heart to no longer believe. A person sins so much, they get to the point, I don't think Jesus loves me anymore. I don't think I'm going to go to heaven. No, you got to wake up, just get, get back in obedience. You'll be all right. 1 John chapter 3. We're almost done. 1 John chapter 3. And uh, go to verse uh, 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And I want to read that in the NKJV, see if there's a, a difference. It says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Confidence about what? And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So the next thing that obedience does is it brings favor. Favor would be what we would call an open heaven. I call upon him. He's answering me. He's answering me quickly. Why? Because I'm in right standing with him. I, and I have a confidence. Why? My heart doesn't condemn me. When does your heart condemn you? Your heart only condemns you when you're in sin. Am I right or am I wrong? Amen? And lastly, again, our obedience always blesses others. It always does. Somehow, some way, your obedience to God is going to impact someone else around you. Your parents, your coworkers, your friends, somebody's going to see the light of the glory of God, and they're going to be transformed. And there might be some of you who are here, and maybe you say, you know, Pastor, but my testimony isn't so good. I got hope for you. You can get up, and you can move forward. And maybe your testimony might have discouraged a couple people along the way. Mine has too. We all have. If it's not what you've done, it's what you haven't done. There's something you've lacked to do. I mean, I, I met a woman one time at the ice cream shop. You know, she knew of me because me and her, uh, the, uh, me and her niece knew each other. And she said, this was like five years ago. She said to me, you're a pastor? You're not dressed up. I looked at her like, what the heck? You know, people have their expectations for you. They, and, and, and here's the thing. So if you're a pastor and you drive a Corolla, the Lord ain't blessing you much. And if you drive an Alexis, you, he's doing something wrong. I mean, you can't win with everybody, but you can win with some. Can't worry about the people that maybe you've impacted negatively. You just got to make your decision. You know what? I'm going to try to be the best that I can be for the glory of God. And I'm not going to be able to reach and touch everyone, but there's someone I can reach. Even if it's one person. Think about that. Even if you want just one person to Christ, you have no idea how much that would mean to God. How many of you are parents in this room? Lift up your hands. All the way. Lift it up. I want to ask you a question. If your child, God forbid, was kidnapped, and somebody said, I found your child, and they brought your child back. How happy would you be as a parent? You would be happy. God knows he can't get the whole world. He wants the whole world, but he wants one at a time. If we can't win the whole world, Let's win our next door neighbor. Let's win our coworker. Let's win our family. Let's win our friends. 
one person makes a difference to his heart. For all the people that God is going to lose that are going to end up spending eternity in hell, one person comforts his heart. Let's do our job this week. Let's get back into obedience so that we can call upon his name, we can see the results, and we can be a blessing to someone else. Amen? Let's stand up on our feet.